I did the world's first brain surgery in a bear in the rainforest using a mattress pump in an emergency to complete the operation. I've anesthetized hundreds of seals, many of which have tried to commit suicide under anesthesia, and I did the world's first keyhole appendix removal in a sick wild orangutan. I'm Romaine Pitsy, and I'm a wildlife veterinarian. And Romaine has given us unique access to terabytes worth of his own self-shot footage. Here, we'll be covering three different surgeries. Not only were we having to perform the first brain surgery in a bear, but it was also in a jungle, in a very undeveloped country, and having to fit everything we could possibly need in two suitcases. Champa was a rescued moon bear in Laos that was confiscated as a tiny cub. Now, she had quite a swollen head, but she was behaving normally when she was tiny. But as she got older, rescue workers started to suspect there was something wrong with her brain. She stopped being able to see, she started to have a lot of mucus draining from her nose, and she moved very, very slowly, and that's when they contacted me. Romaine thought Jampa might have hydrocephalus, a condition where fluid builds up inside the skull, crushing the brain. Now, there's no MRI in the whole country when we had this case, so we had to figure out a different way to do this. So 9,000 kilometers away in Scotland, Romaine had to get creative. I got a bear skull and actually took x-rays of it so I could plan where would be the closest place that I would be able to access her brain. So I poured some latex in the inside and made a mold of what the shape of the brain is and then planned on the computer how I would approach the brain if this was water in the brain hydrocephalus. Probably the biggest challenge of the whole endeavor is flying to the other side of the world to do brain surgery without knowing if you've actually got the diagnosis right. His first step was anesthetizing Champa, and even that can have catastrophic results. Too high a dose could be fatal for Champa, too little could be fatal for Romain. I have had a bear wake up in me on one occasion when I was operating, and I wasn't finished yet, and it started to shrug itself on the table, and that can be quite a scary incident when you have a 150 kilogram, really quite dangerous animal waking up, and you're not finished you now, Laos is obviously a very underdeveloped country with limited facilities even for human health care. We're not going to be able to get a vein and put a little catheter in as you could do in a pet or a human patient. We need to dart our patient. So the safest place to dart a bear is in the hind muscles, so the back leg in the top of the leg, basically it's bum. With Champa darted and asleep, Romaine drilled a tiny hole into her skull. And the diagnosis was correct, hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus is a common condition in human children and easily treated by draining the excess fluid down to the abdomen using a tube. The body then absorbs the fluid. But obviously a bear is not like a child and will climb trees and rub itself and it has sharp claws. Sharp claws that could rip the tube out. Catastrophically, the brain could either collapse on itself or the shunt could actually block. So we buried this little shunt just behind the base of the ear so it wouldn't be able to get its claws there. We could make a very big incision and put the tube in, but then the bear would risk opening this. So we want to do everything by keyhole surgery. Keyhole surgery is where we use specialized, very thin instruments so that we only end up with tiny surgical wounds and we use a special surgical telescope to be able to see inside the body while we do it. Now the anatomy of a bear skull is really different. Bears have a big sinus on the top of their head, that's a big air filled space. So where you'd put your tube in an infant wouldn't work in a bear because it would disappear into the sinus on top of the head. And so we actually had to drill a little hole much further back. With the hole drilled and the shunt run down to Champa's abdomen, the team were on the home stretch until the electricity went out. So we borrowed a mattress pump and what we did is ran that in very short bursts just to put room air into the abdomen just to give us enough space to do the last bit of the operation, which we did very quickly just to make sure that we don't put too much pressure in the abdomen. This is an ingenious retractor which is only five millimeters and we can stick down the little tube so it can go safely in the abdomen and then by turning the handle, it will turn into the surgical equivalent of a keyhole surgery hand. The surgery took six hours. The next morning, Romain went down to Champa's den. After years of pain and eyesight problems, Champa woke up and started to look at Romain and the team in the eyes. The surgery was a success. Every year, all over Europe, many orphaned grey and harbour seal pups need rescuing and hand rearing and then they return to the wild. Now, one of the most common problems that I see as a surgeon is actually seals with a ruptured eye. Now, I've anesthetized hundreds of seals, but they're still a really challenging patient because they actually try to commit suicide under anesthesia, which is a bit nerve wracking and quite frustrating. Because seals live in water, we describe them as having something called a dive reflex. 
If you hold your breath for a prolonged period of time, you'll feel that you need to take a breath. You cannot make yourself unconscious by holding your breath. As soon as you're gonna lose consciousness, you will actually, your brain will make you take a breath. Now that doesn't work with seals because if you're diving underwater and you feel like you're building up carbon dioxide or running low on oxygen, the worst thing you can do is take a breath because you'll drown. So they have a whole range of different adaptations that their body uses to try and get around this. It slows their heart down and it changes changes the blood flow through different blood vessels. It'll dilate the blood vessels to the heart and the brain and the kidneys, those vital organs, but it will constrict blood vessels to other non-vital organs. Now the problem is under anesthesia it can be difficult to recognize and understand what's happening. And the seal might go into these dive reflexes and as we try and wake it up and it runs a little bit low in oxygen and a bit high in carbon dioxide, it actually slows its heart down and circulates worth and it dies. And so these are things that we have to be very aware of with how we anesthetize seals and how we monitor them during anesthesia. The simplest solution to preventing this whole dive reflex is to actually breathe really well for our seals. And all we need to do is regularly squeeze the ambu bag that we're using to give oxygen and anesthetic gases to our patient regularly throughout the anesthesia, and that will prevent any of these reflexes from happening. With the seal safely sedated, Remain must remove the ruptured eye. Once you take the eyeball out, what could happen is the skin can heal down into the socket and you'll end up with a little cavity. Now that could accumulate little sea creatures and all sorts of debris if that animal goes back to the wild and we can't let that happen. So to solve that, once we've taken the eyeball out and before we close the skin, we make a mesh of stitches across that orbit so that when the skin starts to sink down, it hits that mesh. Now I can use a thermal camera to judge how the eye's healing and to tell if there's any infection because the blubber heals very differently. So this is what my eye would look like. Now you'll actually see that my glasses will reflect infrared from the light, but a seal's eye can look quite different, especially if there's an injury around the eye or the eye has been partly punctured. It'll radiate a lot less heat because it's actually a smaller structure. But I also have to be really careful on how I suture this closed so that it's watertight very soon and the seal can go back into water a day or two after its operation. So Miria was a very specific case. She'd been confiscated from a farmer because she'd been raiding his fruit trees and he put her in a wooden crate and kept her like that for two years. So she'd gone to one of the rescue centers and she was doing really well when she suddenly got very severely ill. So they rushed her into the clinic and took some x-rays and this is when they saw the nail. This was a large metal nail and no one could figure out where it was. It looked like it might be just up her bottom and she was going to pull it out, but the nail never passed. And that's when I got involved. Now, orangutans have quite a long appendix, a lot longer than ours, and little heavy things like stones, and in this case, the nail, will typically get lodged there, and they can cause a problem. An appendicitis and either puncture the appendix or the appendix can rupture. So now we know what the problem is, but our challenge is how to do surgery so it doesn't turn into a disaster. Because orangutans are probably the most intelligent of all the great apes. And that's really interesting. Although we may be more closely related to chimpanzees, chimpanzees learn in a group whereas orangutans live on their own. And so the youngsters will spend much longer with their mom learning all the life skills. And they have a very problem solving way of thinking about the world. But when I do surgery or anyone else does something like that and they've got a little bit of discomfort, their first inclination is to open any wound and try and explore that. Now that can be an absolute disaster if you open up the abdomen because if they open the wound and play with the intestines, that will be fatal. And that's why keyhole surgery is so vital in orangutans. To make the tiny incisions that we're going to stick our keyhole surgery instruments through really taxes one's eyesight. And that's why I use magnifying loops to have a look at what I'm doing. And that just allows me to see and keep sterile without having my face right against the orangutan, the tiny area that I'm working in. Orangutan's appendix surgery is the same as human appendix surgery, but Romaine has to use even smaller incisions. In Miria's case, an orangutan, because she's so clever and we were worried she'd open those holes, I used even smaller instruments. So these are even just three millimeters in diameter, barely larger than a microchip needle. And those tiny holes don't even really need stitches and there's no chance that she'd be able to open them or even poke a grass blade inside to interfere with the operation after I'm finished. 
Now, Miria had a really good outcome. She recovered really quickly. She almost didn't notice she'd had surgery because those wounds were so tiny. She was eating an hour after she woke up. A couple of months later, when they were preparing to get her ready to go back to the wild, they actually managed to foster a small baby onto her. And she was great. And she took this little baby and looked after it and started to teach her things. And when they released Miria back to the forest, she took the baby with her. And they've been monitoring her the last few years. And it's almost five years now that she and her now quite large infant that she's adopted are doing really well. So that is something really deeply satisfying that the operation actually resulted in such a happy outcome.